Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear friends of the Schiller Institute, what a joy to welcome people from so many nations here in Strasbourg in person after circumstances forced us to hold our Schiller conferences only virtually for over three years. But we use this time well to bring together so many new forces worldwide with which we can intervene together at this crucial, crucial moment in world history to create a new paradigm for the future of humanity. Let me say it straight away. Even if our continent is in an existential crisis, we will not allow its demise. Rather, we will revive the best of what European culture has produced and what is now buried under the speech balloons of a decadent counterculture and the barbarism of the diehards of the past. And we will bring that into the shaping of the new paradigm. Unquestionably, we are now in the most dangerous moment the human species has ever faced. And we are very close to extinction as a species on this planet, because that would be the consequence of a global nuclear war. And contrary to what the propaganda of the transatlantic mainstream media claims, the danger is not due to Russia's unprovoked war of aggression or to China's increasingly aggressive imperial power grab, but to the transatlantic forces who are unscrupulously playing with nuclear fire while attempting by all means to exert unipolar do dominance over the world when it has long since been moving in a multipolar direction. While the SM Main Street media slander Putin as, or slander as Putin sympathizers, anyone who dares to think that history did not begin on February 24th, and while NATO and the U.S. government fund organizations that put people on lists that put their lives in danger, the nations of the Global South have very much gained an independent view of things. The six-fold expansion of NATO to the east, coming a thousand kilometers closer to the borders of Russia, despite promises to the contrary, can be just as little covered up as the efforts of the Northern Atlantic Defense Alliance to expand in the Indo-Pacific region as global NATO. Above all, with the increasingly blatant and arrogant appeals with which representatives of the rules-based order demand that the whole world submit to their intrigues and their indulgences in modern grab, such as carbon tax or CO2 emissions trading, they have crossed the Rubicon. But it is by doing so that they hope to prolong the existence of the hopelessly bankrupt neoliberal financial system at least a bit longer. We're per we are currently experiencing a change of epoch, albeit not of the kind that Chancellor Schultz referred to on February 24th, 2022, which amounts to the militarization of Europe as a protectorate of the United States. Rather, what we're seeing is the end of some 500 years of colonialism, which the countries of the global south are determined to finally shake off with the help of China and the Belt and Road Initiative. For example, at the recent International Finance Summit in Paris, President Ramaphosa demanded that the international community to provide funding for the Inga Dam. Uh, I quote, let's get that done, and then we will be convinced that you are serious with the promises that you make. It's estimated that the price tag would be $80 billion and generate at least 42 gigawatts of e electricity, which would have an absolutely revolutionary impact on the entire continent's energy supply and economy. End of quote. 
More than 30 nations have applied for membership in the BRICS, which will then include the world's most populous countries. The attempt, coming mainly from the U.S. and the U.K., to decouple from China or to de-risk, as this foolish praise has come to be called, when all these countries are closely linked with China. So this can only lead to economic suicide or to an equally suicidal formation of geopolitical blocks, which would carry the seeds of a world war. In the face of this tectonic shift of power, which occurs at most once or twice in a millennium, the European nations, but also America, must decide whether they want to cooperate productively with this emerging world order, or whether they, NATO, the US, the UK, will opt for total confrontation and the attempt to oppress the absolute majority of the human species. Now, the decision between these two options will test at the same time our own moral fitness to survive. Are we, as rational beings, able to give ourselves, together with the global south, an order that guarantees the coexistence of us all? or, as Leibniz would put it, that allows for the happiness of future generations? Or are we soulless human machine guns, hatefully directed only toward the destruction of the supposed enemy? This is not an academic question, as will become obvious in four days at the annual NATO summit in Vilnius, at which the Hungarian government thankfully announced that Ukraine's admission to NATO will remain out of the question for as long as the war continues. That should really be self-evident. Now, however, there are various statements by Berlin's two leading think tanks, the uh, Foundation for Policy and, and Economy, and the German Society for um, Exterior Policy, both are close to the government, about possible security guarantees for Ukraine outside of formal NATO membership. Even if these are only ideas from think tanks and not necessarily the policies of Berlin, these papers deserve the closest attention because their authors are typical of the so-called experts who speak nonstop on talk shows and in this way influence the views of the population. It's not only in France that there has been a great deal of concern recently about Germany's complete, seemingly complete loss of all sovereignty, as could be seen in the German government's lack of response to the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipelines. Now, it must be taken into consideration that this one take, the SWP, which advises the government, the Bundestag, the European Union, NATO, the UN, among others, it was created on the initiative of the BND, the uh, intelligence service, which itself was founded under the aegis of the American occupying power in 1962 and it incorporated personnel from the military intelligence service Fremde Heere Ost and the Galen organization. The SWP was initially based in Ebenhausen, which is a small town near where the uh, BND was headquartered. And the much larger German Society for Foreign Policy has 2,800 members, and it was founded as early as 1955 in cooperation with and modeled on the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations and the British Royal Institute for International Affairs. Now, on the 29th of June, uh, 2023, the SWP put out a paper called From Ad Hoc Support to Long-Term Security Guarantees as a NATO Member. And there it stated that there are two options, apart from full NATO membership, that could guarantee Ki Kiev's security. 
The first is demilitarization of Russia by reducing its armed forces and arms industry to a level that rules out offensive operations. This would only be possible through external shocks, a clear defeat of the army, a renunciation by the leadership of its neo-imperial understanding of its role, which would require a change of regime, and the simultaneous denuclearization of Russia's military possible, the potential. Excuse me. That, however, they say is currently unrealistic. The second option would be for for Ukraine, but just the idea that one would think of such a, 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 an idea is insane. But the second option would be for Ukraine to build up its own nuclear arsenal. And just in case, the GGAP, the German society, provided yet another option s circulating under the keyword hedgehog as an animal that symbolizes such a re massive rearmament of Ukraine into a kind of super armory that it would defer, deter all future attacks. This includes the variant proposed by the chairman of the British Defense Committee, Tobias Elwood, which envisages support from a coalition of the willing, of the willing and a powerful task force a joint European defense initiative. Germany's Rheinmetall Group has already announced plans to build a modern tank factory and other weapons factories in Ukraine. Meanwhile, U.S. defense contractors, Grumman, Raytheon, Lockheed, Martin, they sponsored champagne receptions at the Ukrainian embassy in Washington not least to celebrate the memorandum of understanding that the world's largest financial services firm, BlackRock, which manages $10 trillion in assets, uh, landed with the Ukrainian government. This JD, Joint European Defense Initiative, is only intended to help bridge the gap. In the long term, NATO membership is indispensable. And the goal is to anchor Ukraine irrevocably into the Euro-Atlantic Euro structures. The priority, therefore, is to proactively communicate to their own populations the meaning, purpose, and goals of NATO membership for Ukraine, and to take action against institutions that claim to be part of civil society, like the Schiller Institute, but are in fact controlled by the Russian state. We are not controlled, just for the record I say that. What a nightmare. The largely destroyed Ukraine is to be transformed into a mega armed country, a hedgehog, or rather, into a permanent cash cow, cash cow for the military industrial complex on both sides of the Atlantic. It will become a frozen conflict that can be activated at any time as a permanent crossing of the red lines defined by Russia, which is supposed to be ruined, according to Baerbock, or permanently weakened, according to Lloyd Austin, the Ruzi, Stoltenberg, and others. There's not a single thought about ending the war through diplomacy. No peace negotiations, no positive vision for the Ukrainian people, and certainly not a peace order for the world as a whole. What an ugly, destructive spirit rears its head here. No human emotion influences the, this thinking. It's cold as a robot, which is steered by a worm-eating algorithm. And we can add to that that the U.S. government has just decided to deliver straw, uh, uh, um, straw bombs, uh, dispersal bombs to Ukraine. But the arrogance that leads some to claim that they belong to the camp of the good people and they can therefore suggest the most horrendous things with impunity also blinds them. The reality is by no means that the Russian economy is collapsing, quite the contrary. 
Economic growth in May was 5.4 percent, while Germany is officially in recession, and Russia was forced by the sanctions to build up many branches of production for its own benefit and redirect trade patterns from the West to Asia, where the momentum of the world economy is building anyway. The transatlantic financial sector, on the other hand, is sitting on a bubble of two quadrillion dollars of outstanding derivatives contracts. That's a two with 15 zeros, which ultimately means hopeless systemic debt. Central banks are switching back and forth between QE and QT in apparent disorientation. But Joseph Borrell, EU High Representative for Foreign Policy, takes the cake. He recently stated with utmost arrogance at the European Diplomatic Academy in Bruges that Europe is a garden, while most of the world, the rest of the world is a jungle that could intrude into it. Now, such a point of view will find no sympathy among the 5,000-year-old cultural peoples of Asia who, together with other countries of the global south, have long been putting into place a new world economic order. And while Mr. Borrell is now regarded as a comedian, but not one one would invite to a visit, or among the f nearly 50 percent of Germany, German companies that are fleeing the country due to the mismanagement of the German government and the unaffordable energy prices, They have no sympathy for such of you either. Now, hearing Borel's misplaced comparison of a garden, one is reminded of scene 10 in Act 2 of Schiller's play Don Carlos, when the Marquis of Posa, who sees himself as a citizen of the world and carries the liberation of Flanders from the Spanish in his heart, he confronts King Philip II, the absolute ruler of Spain. And uh, one is, re yeah, he's, he says, uh, Philip says something like, Behold my Spain, look, the burgers good blooms uh, in eternal and unclouded peace. A peace like this will I bestow on Flanders. And the Marquis, the Marquis de Posa answers, the churchyard's peace. And do you hope to end the universal spring that shall renew the earth's fair form? Would you alone in Europe fling yourself down before the rapid wheel of destiny? Vain thoughts. Now, the absolute majority in Germany, for example, has lost confidence in the government. And according to recent surveys, 79% are not satisfied with the government's policies. Here in France, we've just seen in what state the social fabric is, in this part of the garden. No wall can be built high enough to protect that garden, Borel says. Well, we see at the external borders of the EU what these walls look like. Pope Francis described the reception camps for refugees in the border countries of Europe as concentration camps, which are surrounded by high walls topped with NATO barbed wire and are repulsive enough to, defer, to deter people from venturing in small boats over the Mediterranean, which has long since been turned into a horrendous mass grave. No, Mr. Borrell, this Europe is not a garden. It's a continent that competent politicians such as Charles de Gaulle and Konrad Adenauer wanted to bring out of the rubble of the Second World War into a better future, and which a thoroughly decadent political caste, having thrown out the window its duty of peace, is now leading into a renewed catastrophe that threatens to far surpass the horrors of the Second World War.
And if large parts of the world outside of Europe resemble a jungle, it's because Europe has not, in the past centuries, has not developed Africa. But well-known families in the transatlantic world have built their fortunes on the slave trade. They drew profits from the opium trade, and they're profiting from the modern successor of colonialism, the casino economy, in which the wealthy determine the roles of our oh-so-fantastically organized rules-based order. Or maybe other reasons are a jungle because the transatlantic interventionist armies took up residence there, as NATO did for 20 years in Afghanistan, during which time nothing was built, and then they left the country in ruins. Or in Iraq, where a country rising to modernity was bombed back into the Stone Age, and concerning which Madeleine Albright said the death of 500,000 Iraqi children was a fair price to pay for the right to continue ruining the country. And we could prolong the list of this country, of these countries, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Haiti, and so on. But there is a way out. The nations of the global south, whose existence was just recently discovered by the G7, apparently, in the Hiroshima uh, summit, and which represent the overwhelming majority of humanity, have long been shaking off the shackles of modern colonialism and creating a new international currency, new development banks, a new credit system. Over 30 countries have applied for membership in BRICS Plus, the SCO, the African Union, ASEAN, the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, Mercosur, and other organizations have moved to carry out their trade in national currencies. 151 countries now cooperate, cooperate with China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary and which managed during that decade to make sure that the term developing countries really does apply to the countries of the global south. Now, we here in Europe, and even in America, have to give up the already doomed attempt to contain the rise of these countries by decoupling or de-risking. We have to replace confrontation which in any case only benefits the military-industrial complex, with cooperation. Germany, France, Italy, and all other European nations must become part of the new paradigm in international relations. Our middle class, now bankrupt under the old paradigm, can not only help build the Inga Dam, but realize the Transaqua project that will provide electricity to 12 more nations in Africa. We can cooperate with China to provide the entire global south with a high-speed rail system. We can build ports and waterways, green the deserts through large-scale desalinization of seawater, and build new cities. Yes, and while we're at it, we could also modernize our own ailing infrastructure instead of enri enriching the defense industry and impoverishing the population. We can repair our schools, make the health care system uh, function again, intensify international cooperation on the fusion project ITER as a crash program, and that way achieve commercial use of fusion energy faster and we can spare ourselves all the pollution and the destruction of our landscapes with unspeakable wind turbines. turbines. And we can also rebu rebuild Ukraine as a bridge between Central Europe and Russia. To bring Europe and America onto this path is our commitment. And let us remember what Por Posa said to King Philip and what we, together with Schiller, say to the many Borels of today. Give up your unnatural deification that destroys us. You would plant for all eternity, 
and yet the seeds you sow around you are the seeds of death. This hopeless task, with nature's laws and strife, will ne'er survive the spirit of its founder. Restore us all you have deprived us of, and generous and strong, let happiness flow from your horn of plenty. Let man's mind ripen in your vast hum- empire. Give us back all you have taken from us, and become, amidst a thousand kings, a king indeed. Today, we no longer need a king. But as a variation on Poe's words today, let us say, let a garden amidst a million gardens bloom. Thank you.